morning and uh, every day as he is the Lord. Well, I don't know if you heard about the story about the lion. Of course, he thought he was a pretty big shot being the lion. And so one day he walks through the jungle and he comes up to the bear and he tells the bear, hey bear, who is the king of the jungle? And of course, the bear timidly says, you're Mr. Lion, you Mr. Lion, you're king of the, you're king of the jungle. Then he goes over to the tiger and says, Mr. Tiger, who is king of the jungle? You, you Mr. Lion, you, you Mr. Lion. And then he goes up to the elephant and says, hey elephant, who is the king of the jungle? Of course, the elephant doesn't say a word. He just takes his trunk, wraps it around the neck of that lion, starts beating him upside the head against the cliff, flips him upside down, hits him on the head on the other side of the cliff, turns him upside down with his trunk, and beats him till he's almost a pulp, swings him around and throws him out in the lake. Boy, the lion gets out dripping wet, bruised, bleeding, can hardly walk, can hardly talk. He looks at the, at the elephant, he said, look, just cause you didn't know the answer to the question is no reason to get mean about it. <laughs> but sometimes as men, we can be that way, amen? Our ego, our pride, sometimes we think we are the king of our jungle, and we're not. And sometimes it takes something like that in our life to say, you know what, I'm not really in charge. I'm not really who I think I may be, and the Lord has ways of doing that. But once we come and find out and put the Lord in focus and put his, his word first, then we can focus on being a man who leaves a legacy. A man who makes a difference. A man who will leave this earth making an impact. Not just leaving material possessions, but leaving a legacy for those who would look at our lives and say they made a difference for Christ. And ladies, don't tune this out because the five, four principles that we look at will be the same things for ladies, being a lady of God. So don't just think, well, I came this morning and know that he was gonna preach to the guys. But it's all universal walking with God, whether you're male, female, or whatever, whoever, it still applies to each one of us as we look. And the person that I really sought after to say, what man in the scripture, of course, there's so many, would exude this kind of person. And this person would be one likelihood that none of the disciples would have ever voted this person to be the example. Matter of fact, they'd have voted this person completely out because of who they were. And we're gonna look at this passage of the centurion. First of all, in order to be that man that leaves a legacy, you need to be a man who lives out a biblical view of Jesus. It says here that when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. There's a rule right there. If you ever need help, go to Jesus. Not last, but first. He's the source of help. So at least he went to the right place. And then in verse six, it says, Lord. And then the centurion, in verse eight, the centurion replied, Lord. And we see later on, he was bringing a request to heal his servant, which was probably a servant boy. But before we go any further, you can see his addressing the Lord. First of all, who was he? Well, he was a centurion, which meant he was in the military, in the Roman military, and he was over a hundred men. Obviously, the word century, centurion, a hundred men. So this man had a great career. He was up in the military. He had a hundred men under him. He was like the manager of these men. He was their sergeant, he was their lieutenant, he was their captain, he was their leader. He was the person in charge of these men. And he was looked up to in the Roman society. He would be a person on a pillar. He would be a person that others would look up to and say, man, that's a centurion. Now not so would he be looked up to in the Jewish community. Because he had two strikes against him. One, he was a Gentile. Ugh, to the Jew, a Gentile. And then he was a leader in the very government that opposed the Jewish people, which were the Roman government. So he had, according to all around him, two strikes against him. Some people would think the audacity of him even coming to Jesus, having those two things against him. But that doesn't hold him back. And the first thing he recognizes, even as a Gentile, this man is the Lord. 
Now, of course, some people say, well, he just said that. You can say Lord, and we're gonna talk about that later. But I believe he meant it based on what he's about to say and what he's about to do proves, I believe, he really did believe not only Jesus was Lord, but that he had the right to be Lord. If we're gonna be a man or a woman that's gonna be following after God and leaving a legacy, the number one thing we need to do is for Jesus really to be Lord. So many people, it's like, well, I think I'll take him as Savior, but I don't want to take him as Lord. You can't split him up that way. You know, just like you come to me saying, Brother Tim, I want to be your friend, but I cannot accept you being a dad. Well, you got to take me all. If you're going to take me as a friend, you got to take me as I'm somebody's dad. You can't split that up. Look, in the scriptures, there, there's almost 15 times more references to Jesus as Lord than there is Savior. And every time he's mentioned as Lord and Savior, it's always Lord first. He is Lord, he does saving. Amen. Now I know what a lot of people mean, that, well, Brother Tim, when I first got saved, I just, it took me a while, I started you know, giving the Lord more and more of my life. Yes, and that'll be continual, that we'll continue to give up more and more to him as Lord. But when you receive him, you can't split him up. <laughs> you either got to take him as Lord or not. And this mentality that I'm just going to allow him to save me and that he's not going to run the show because he has to run whatever he is he's in charge of, which would be us. You know, one of the worst bumper stickers there are as far as in the Christian community is the one that says, God is my co-pilot. That's, that's a terrible bumper stick. If you're going to use the analogy airplane, then God is your pilot. You know, scratch that code. You know, it's kind of like you driving in a car. If the Lord is the Lord of your life and your life is a car, he is driving and you're not. Now, a lot of people believe Jesus is my Lord. What they mean is this. I'm driving and I'm letting Jesus sit in my front seat. And I'll take a few orders from him and if I don't like what he says, then I won't turn the direction that he says or do what he says. And if he says break, I'll break if I want to or not if I want to because I have the steering wheel of my life, I got the brake of my life and I got the gas pedal of my life. That's not lordship. Then some people move toward, well, I'll let him drive but I'm gonna sit right next to him so where I can at least reach it and grab it from him if need be. That's not lordship. Some people get in the back seat but never shut up and tell the Lord how to drive. That's not lordship. Now you can pray, obviously, and seek the Lord and ask him to. The lordship is like, Lord, you drive my life the way your word and the way your commands say to do, or he's not Lord. Let's quit saying these things. Remember, that's what even Jesus said. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Why? Because it's easy to say, Lord, Lord. I just said it twice right there. It was real easy. It just comes off. A lot of peace, Lord. Now you ask anybody, any Christian, or anybody that says they're a Christian, is Jesus Lord? Yes, he is. He is the Lord. But then you ask him, this, is he the Lord of your life? Does he run your car, your steering wheel? Is he driving or are you driving? And Jesus made that clear that there's going to be a lot of people who say, Lord, Lord, and their next event will be hell. And they even did a lot of religious things, it says in Matthew. But the issue is lordship. Did you do? Not did you say, but did you do? You say, but Brother Tim, Jesus tells some hard things to do. And some things I really don't like to do. Join the club. <laughs> but he's the Lord. But you know, there has to be some things that we can't do or we'd never know he's not Lord. When Adam and Eve were, were created, remember he only said you can't eat from one tree. Now I don't know, there may have been millions of other trees and they had no restrictions there, just the one. Now part of that, I believe, was to say if there was no restrictions, how could you even know if you're obeying a command? And if there were no commands, the ones we like and the ones we don't like, then how would we know if he is the Lord? 
How could we ever test ourselves? And of course, Adam and Eve failed because the, the devil came in and basically was saying, you know what? God's keeping you from fun. You know, a lot of people view Christians that way. Those poor Christians, especially those poor committed Christians, they are missing out on so much of the good life. I feel sorry for those people. Even Christians who say there's Christians, and look at those what they call committed Christians, which I don't see how they could be any other way other than backslidden, than to say, I just feel for them because they're letting the Lord be the Lord of everything as if God's holding back. And Adam and Eve thought that same thing. And so they're thinking, you know what? The devil says the Lord's holding me back by not having this one tree. I can eat of those million, but this one he says no. And I know he must be holding something back, so we're gonna go ahead and eat of that. How'd that work out? Everything was perfect. Work was easy. Labor was fine. That didn't work out very good. I don't think God was holding anything back. And you know what? I'll find out, even if I don't know it now, that everything that I obey that he says to do, it's always going to work out for my good. Even though the devil tells me, no, it's not, no, you know, take that steering wheel sometime. No, he comes right now and says he's the Lord. It's kind of like the little boy who went to elementary school, five years old, he went to camp. And the camp counselor was showing, you know, look at all the woods and the trees and the mountains and the forest and the, the stars and, the, you know, it and God, all this creation was so good from God. And this one little five-year-old said, yeah, but why did God make poison ivy? <laughs> and the counselor was stumped. Uh, uh. And this little five-year-old boy felt so sorry for that counselor. He just was just stumbling all over his way. He didn't know how to answer that. Why God made poison ivy then? So the little boy stood up and said, because God wanted to teach everybody that there are certain things in life you ought to just keep your cotton-picking hands off of. And that's true. There are some things that you ought to just keep your cotton-picking hands off of because it's for your own good. I won't poison ivy. Ivy says, well, go ahead and roll in it and see what happens. And the same thing is true here when you don't do what it says to do and you won't let him be Lord in an area, that's the area you'll get up itching from. Or probably worse than that. But because this man identified him as the Lord. And if we're gonna go any further as a man, a lady, whoever wants to make a legacy from their life, it's all gonna start there. If he's not the Lord of all, then I ask you a question, is he the Lord at all? And so here the, the centurion makes this very clear to us in this passage. The second thing, you may have to click it from there, is be a man who lives out a biblical view of others. A, a biblical view of others. In verse six it said, Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. In terrible suffering. My servant. He has a slave boy, and this term, if you look it up in the Greek, probably means a younger boy. So this is a, a young boy, one of his young boy slaves, is in pain. He wants him to be ministered to. He's ill. I, I won't help for him. Now look, this is a man who's got a lot of responsibility. He's got 100 employees. He's, he's got a home that at least is also another business because he's got servants working for him there. And he takes time out of his busy day as a very important person to come and meet with Jesus so that his little servant boy could be healed. That's amazing that he would care so much about somebody else that the world would say is insignificant because he was, in that culture, a slave. And in that culture would not be viewed in high esteem. But he was high esteemed to him, the centurion. And he wanted to come to Jesus. Why? Because his love for other people. You know, when you pass on from this life, how you loved yourself is not going to be remembered. It's how you loved others that's going to be remembered. It's not what you obtained. It's not what you accomplished. It's what you did for others. And this man loved other people. Like the little uh, son that went, uh, grandson went to his grandpa and said, Papa, I like me best 
when I'm around you. That's what other people ought to say about you. I like me best when I'm around you because they can see in us that we care about other people. And we're not focused on us. We're focused on others. He didn't come for his healing. He didn't come for his personal request. He came for a personal request of somebody else that was his slave, his servant. This man is spoke highly of in Luke 7, 4. It's there up there of what it said. Luke adds some extra on this. If you can click that right here, you can see that passage. It says, when they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, he is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. The Jewish people told Jesus, grant it to him, grant it to him. This man is worthy, he's worthy. Why is he so worthy? He loves our nation and even helped build our synagogue, even though he's not Jewish. And he could never step in there because it would defile the synagogue because he's a Gentile. He helped us build our synagogue. This man is a man who concerned about others, who loves others, who reaches out. You know what five rules for getting out of depression and getting out of the blues are? You know what the five-step program for that is? One, do something good for somebody else and repeat that four times. And you're on your way. You see, we can help other people and the happiest people in the world you'd think would be those that would say, I'm gonna do everything on this planet for me. I'm gonna make sure I get all my needs satisfied. I'm gonna make sure I get all my toys. I'm gonna make sure everything happens for me. Anything that depresses me, anything that doesn't benefit me, I'm not gonna do. You'd think those people would be the happiest people on the planet and they're the most miserable. And the people that are most happy is the people that aren't concerned about themselves and concerned about other people. You ever catch that? See why well, a lot of people, especially in Hollywood, that you can see people that, not all people from Hollywood, a lot of them are self-absorbed, drug rehab, this rehab, that rehab, this, in jail for this and in jail for that. Why? Because many of them, it's all about them. And for this man, it's all about others. And if we're gonna leave a legacy, not only Jesus must be the Lord, our view of other people must be they're more important than me and they need to be focused on more than me. Then the next one is be a man who lives out a biblical view of himself. Not only a biblical view of, of Jesus, not only a biblical view of others, but a biblical view of himself. What's his view of himself? Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. And the centurion replied, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Matter of fact, it says there in the King James, as, as you click the next one, it says that, in the King James, it says, I am not worthy. The Greek word is sufficient in ability, fit or enough. Don't come to my house. I'm not worthy. No, wait, didn't we read back in Luke that the people said one thing? This man is worthy. But the man himself says, I'm not worthy. Proverbs says that. Let other people praise you and not from your own mouth. <laughs> don't praise yourself. If you're gonna be praised, let somebody else do it. And don't go to somebody and say, can you say this about me? <laughs> no, just let other people praise if you're worthy. Don't talk about it, and that's the way he was. He was a man viewed by other people as being worthy, but himself, he says, I'm not worthy for you to even come. That's how humble a man he was. He didn't deserve it. Do you know a lot of happiness comes from this one philosophy? Do I deserve it? In other words, a lot of spouses are upset because they think they deserve this and they don't get it. Now, on the other side of the spouse, you ought to feel like my spouse deserves everything. They're worthy of everything, and you ought to try to meet it. But if I live my life in every situation thinking I deserve much better, I'll be a miserable person. I believe everybody else deserves better is how I should view it. 
And that's what this man was. No wonder he loved other people so much because he thought such less of himself. And this isn't false humility. A lot of people are, oh, I'm just no good. I'm just no good. No, sometimes it can be false humility. Do you know whose job it is for us to be humble? Ours. The Bible says, humble yourself. It says that several passages in the scriptures. Humble yourself. It's my job to do so, but guess what? If I don't do it, God does a real good job. <laughs> but I'd rather do it myself. Just like with your children. You know, you would rather them discipline their self. That's why it's called self-discipline. And that's the way God is as a father, is that he'd rather us humble ourselves. But there's ways that he has to get us to that place. But if you've been like I've been into those places, I would much rather do it myself because I've come through those times saying, Lord, I didn't know I was that proud till you had to do that. I love the story of Governor Herder, which was the governor of Massachusetts. He was seeking re-election this year. So he was going to place to place doing fundraisers and all the things governors do to get re-elected. And so he came to a fundraising event and he, they, were having the, they were feeding all of the people there, you know, the campaign workers and all the people there. So he got in line and, man, he hadn't eaten breakfast. He's been on the campaign trail. He is starving to death. So he goes through the line and he asked, you know, there for chicken. It was barbecue and where he gets a piece. And he saw just one piece on his plate and he thought, man, I hadn't eaten all day. I, I'm just going, ma'am, can I get one more piece? No, one piece of chicken per person. Well, ma'am, I hadn't eaten all day and I've been early and been on the campaign trip. Can I just get one more piece? of? No, it's one piece of chicken per person. He thought, you know what? I, I hate to pull this governor card, but I'm going to do it because this lady doesn't understand. I need another piece of chicken. So he said, ma'am, do you know who I am? I am the governor of this state. She leaned over and said, sir, do you know who I am? I am the lady put in charge of chicken. Now get on down that line. <laughs> See, God will find a way to get us humble, amen? If we think we can do it our way, God will say, no, -uh. it's not gonna work that way in my kingdom because humility is the only avenue for us to follow. But our society balks at that. Here's a man, if Hollywood saw these words, they said, that's a weak man. You ought to be proud of yourself. No, he wasn't. Society continues to want to egg that on. Then the next point is, be a man who lives out a biblical view of faith. What did he say? You don't need to go. Just say the word, my servant will be healed. There, the next click there talks about what that word, word means. It talks from the King, King, the King James says, but speak the word only. It's from the Greek word moron, which means only, alone, without a companion. You don't need to do anything else, Jesus, but just say the word healed and it's done. Well, that's faith. I need nothing more from you, Lord, than your word. That's all we need. Yeah, but Jesus, explain it. Tell me how it's gonna work out. What's gonna be the result? What's gonna happen if I do it? What's gonna happen if I don't do it? No. Jesus, this man was a man who walked by faith to say, just do the word and that's all we need. You don't need an explanation. You don't need anything else. Jesus, you just say your word just like his word was in print said now. That's all this centurion needed. You don't have to go to my house. You don't need to go to my roof because I'm not even worthy for you to come under my roof. I'm even not even worry, worthy of the healing for my servant. But if you'll just say a word, it's done. Boy, oh, that's a man of faith. That's a man walking after faith. That's a man live, living by faith, not relying on others because the Lord can make it happen just by a word. And then this next one, point four, five, is really tied to it, to point four. He said, for I myself am a man under authority. With soldiers under me, I tell this one go, and he goes. And that one come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. I know how this works. I'm a man under authority. 
And therefore, I have authority. A lot of people wonder, just if you just stop right there, that could be a sermon. I just don't have any spiritual power and authority in my life. Are you under authority? Are you under every authority place that you're supposed to be under? Government authority, spousal authority, church authority. Do you place yourself under authority? This man knew the principle. He said, I have people that are above me in rank. And as long as I stay under their authority, then I get authority for those that are under me. Because I got 100 men. But if he balks to the ones that are over him and says, look, I don't want to listen to you guys anymore. Y'all are no good. I'm not going to listen to any of your commands and any of your deal. I'm going to live on my own. The Roman government would have said, then you're yanked out because you'll have no control over these hundred men anymore. They won't have to listen to a word you say. So this centurion got the message. He said, you know what? Because I'm under authority, I get authority. And he knew that Jesus was under a great authority and he had great authority. He said, if I can tell this man, go do this. Matter of fact, what he meant was, even if I send a message, and I don't even say it personally, but if I send a man somewhere else, and that somewhere else gives the command that the centurion said, you gotta go do this, it'll get done, even if I'm not there. Just because I said the word, and the word went and had something happen. So Jesus, if I'm a man under authority, and I tell everybody what to do and they do it, then all you have to do is say a word and it'll happen remotely. Wow, that's, that's great theology. And then in verse 10, it says, when Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. From what I can see in scripture, there was only one other person bragged on more than this man by Jesus, and that was John the Baptist. Next to him, Jesus bragged on this guy more than anybody else because he said, I've looked in all of Israel and nobody has as much faith as that man right there. I can see the disciples going, uh-oh. We've walked with him. We've listened to him. We've ate with him. We've learned under him. This man's never even been around one sermon and this guy beat us bad. Really, while well, he was looking around saying, even more than you guys who've walked with me, nobody in all of Israel has more faith than that man right there. I don't know about you, but I want to do what that man did. Amen. Whatever he did, Jesus was astonished. That blew me away this week. He astonished the Son of God. Another translation, we marveled. You know, it, it only says in the scripture he marveled or, or was astonished by one other thing in the scripture. You know what that was? It was the unbelief of the Jews. That was the only other thing he was astonished by. The Jews' unbelief and this one Gentile's belief. I don't know about you, but I got to focus on what this says. Because if this is something that Jesus is astonished by, I have to replicate this. And if you're a Christian, you want to replicate this. Not to just get patted on the back by Jesus, but something's, something's happening here. He gets faith. He gets authority. Those two concepts go together. I'm a man under authority, and if I'm a man under authority, I've got authority. Jesus went, whoa, that's good. That's good. I am blown away by that. That's good. Gosh, he was astonished. He exercised it. He did what he said to do. And then it says in verse 11, it says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Whoa, where'd that come from? Well, who are these people from the east and the west? That was really the Gentiles. And who are the people of the kingdom? The Jews. You know what Jesus is saying? He said there'll be many Jews who come into the kingdom. And there'll be, I mean, there'll be many Gentiles who come into the kingdom from the east and the west, meaning out of Jerusalem. But there'll also be Jews 
that'll be in hell because they didn't believe in Christ. Just because you're the chosen, you know, they were the chosen generation. That wasn't enough. They had to personally put their faith in Christ. And so what he was saying was, there's gonna be a lot of Gentiles in heaven and there's gonna be some Jews that are not gonna be there. It's all gonna depend, not if you're Jew or Gentile, but did you put your faith in Christ? Do you know what he did? He put that in there. He not only said, we'll take their places at the feast. If you were to talk to a Jew at that time, and you say, what are you looking for in life? One of the things they'd say is that I finally in heaven get to sit down for a meal, not gluten-free, but Gentile-free. Ooh, it's gonna be a good day. I gotta live with them down here. Ooh, I don't like those Gentiles. But one day when I get to heaven, I won't have to see another Gentile, especially sitting down to feast. It's gonna be good. And Jesus said, you're gonna be sitting all around them. There is no place for prejudice anywhere, but especially I'll not be in the church because he's teaching a lesson here. It's not about your race. It's not about what nation you're from. It's not about your male or female. It's about if you know Jesus. And if you know Jesus, you're gonna be sitting down with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Boy, don't you know they didn't like it when he said that. But he made it clear there's no place for that type of feelings toward others. And then in verse 13, it closes out with this. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go. It will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. It's done. It is a done deal. You head on back, and when you get there, you'll notice he's been healed this very hour. You may not get there for several hours, but they're going to tell you he got healed here. That's good. That's a man who's going to leave a legacy in life. Every centurion spoke of in the Bible is spoken of highly, and many believe came to know Christ. I believe this man did. He recognized Jesus' lordship. He submitted to authority and he had authority. Ask yourself this question. If your children submitted to your authority the way you submit to God's authority, would you be okay with it? If your children submitted your authority the way you submit to God's authority, would you be okay with that? You say, clean your room. I'll do it when I get around to it. If I really want to, I will. If I don't, I won't. And you'd say, that's fine. But that's how we do God. Do this. I'll do it if I think about it, if I want to do it, if it's okay. And you're okay with that? Your Father in heaven is not okay with that. Because here, the authority was set by what God wanted. Will our life be a legacy? Yes, we should teach our children responsibility, faithfulness, how to do certain things, how to handle money, how to maybe play a sport. There's, there's a lot of good things we can leave. There's a lot of good things we can teach our children. But we've got to leave a legacy that makes a difference. Because you know, we're two generations from people even knowing who we are because most people can't even say the name of their great-grandfather. We don't even know their name. But our legacy for Christ lives on. Even though our name may be forgot. If we can pass on a legacy of what I just mentioned, it can. I know this was one of David Jensen. He passed away. One of his favorite stories. I wanted to read it. I said it before. It just fits right in here. In the 1987 World Series, St. Louis Cardinals played the Minnesota Twins. Kirby Puckett was the most valuable player of that World Series game. He was probably, some believe, the best right head hitter in the American League since Joe DiMaggio. This guy was fanatic, was fabulous. He was a great ball player. He took them basically to the World Series because of his uh, play. And he was so good in the World Series, he just carried the team on their back. I mean, he just was great. 
And they won, mainly because of him. And that's obviously why he got the most valuable player in the World Series that year. And so the celebration's on. I mean, the champagne's being shook, it's being sprayed, and they're happy, and they've got their ball caps on that say the world champions, and they're celebrating, and the trophy's given to the general manager and passed on to various people and shown to the most valuable player, all that. It's the big hoopla, you've seen it. All the fans are yelling and screaming. They're just heroes to the town. And then afterward, there was an interview by the shortstop of the team a few months later after the World Series victory. Here's what he said. The thing that got my attention was I looked over and there's our hero, the man that carried this team on his back, sitting in his locker with his head down. I thought, what's the deal? So I stepped over all the TV cables and went over and looked at him and said, Kirby, what's going on, man? And he looked up and he said, if this is all there is to it, life is pretty empty. A man who since he was five years old dream, dreamt of only one thing, winning the World Series and being the most valuable player in it. 600 seconds after that happened, that statement was made. See, we all feel like if we could just have that, if we could just do that, if we just could get to that, if we just have what they have, if we could just do what they do, if we could only accomplish that, if we could only have that much money, if we could only have that much fame, if we could only have that much success, and here's a man that says, I had it all. Life's got to be pretty empty if this is all there is. You know what life is for a man or woman to pass on? The right view of Jesus. People see in you, that man, that woman made Jesus Lord of their life. He took the steering wheel from the day they got saved on. They may have let it get back, but they handed it back. They repented and got it back in his hands. He was really Lord. That's a legacy. And that man or woman loved others more than they loved themselves. And that man or that woman lived by faith in the Word of God even though it didn't sound right. And that man or woman had the biblical view of authority to say, that's the way it's going to be for me. Is that our legacy? Is that what they're going to say at our funeral? Or is it going to be like Kirby Puckett? We're at the rocking chair of our life sitting at the nursing home thinking, what did I do with my life? If you're looking for something like Kirby Puckett had, all that success, he's saying, I got that, and that's empty. You know, a few things in life God let me have that I thought I really wanted, and I can say that I said the same thing as Kirby Puckett. I didn't have that kind of success, but some things I really wanted I got, and I think, now what? <laughs> this is the only thing that's fulfilling in life is for Jesus to be Lord, to have the right view of him in all areas. That's a legacy that goes on from generation to generation to generation to generation until Jesus comes back and we live forever in his kingdom. And that's all that's going to be left. We're all getting out of here soon. Whether Jesus comes back or our body clocks hit that final tick, it's out. Just like Jacob, we're studying Wednesday night, he said, I am a sojourner. I don't even belong here. I'm passing through this earth and getting to heaven and that's where I'll spend all of my eternity just passing through. So what are we going to leave? Leave a legacy like this man left. Let's stand as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus.